Namaste and welcome to the next episode of Yoga Vasishta. So now that Rama has been observed to be in a depression, uh, the next person to speak is Vishvamitra, the great sage, and he gives a consolation. What is a consolation? It means he will speak something that makes you feel better, even if the problem isn't actually solved, because it gives you hope. So Vishvamitra begins by making a very important point. The stupor of Rama is not caused by any accident or affection. I believe it is the development of that superior intellect which rises from the right reasoning of dispassionate men. Let Rama come here for a while, and in a moment we shall dispel his delusion as the wind drives away clouds from mountaintops. So Vishvamitra is consoling who? Dasharat. Dasharat, along with the rest of the assembly, is uh, confounded to hear that Rama, who is the hope and the choice of the whole kingdom, is now in a depression. He's in a funk. He's not doing his duties. He's like down on everything. Oh, just wait till you hear what he has to say. <laughs> But Vishvamitra is saying, now, wait a minute. This is not a mental problem. This is not a disease, and it's not accidental either. But this is the state of a mature intelligence. Huh? That superior intellect which rises from the right reasoning of dispassionate men. Dispassionate here is the key word, actually. That Rama is not involved with the passions that destroy reason. Passion means, I know it's wrong, but I'm going to go ahead and do it anyway. <laughs> Passion is based on desire. And desire, of course, is based on the illusion that we can enjoy something, that we can get happiness from some object out there in the world, which, of course, we can't at all. Just to show you, give you an example of what an illusion desire is. Desire is actually a form of suffering because we say, I don't like the way the world is right now. I don't like the way my life is right now. I don't like the way I am right now. I want to change things. I want it to be some other way, some different way than what it is. And this is a kind of tension, isn't it? This is a tension that doesn't resolve until you either give up or get the results of your desire. And let's say that you get the results of your desire. Then what happens? The tension resolves and you so-called enjoy the uh, object of your desire. But what's really happening is you're enjoying the happiness that results from your mind no longer being fixated on an external object and returning back to closer to the self its source. That's the only enjoyment in getting the desires that you, that you hold on to. And what about when you give up? Oh, when you give up, that's what causes depression. Because then there's the mind going, oh, you screwed up, you messed up, you did it wrong, you didn't get what you wanted, and so on and so forth. But in Rama's case, he's already dispassionate. That means his senses are controlled. He's not driven by desires. 
He's driven by what's right. Huh? The superior intellect, which rises from right reasoning. And because of that, he's like down on everything. <laughs> Wait till you hear the chapters coming up. My God. So, <laughs> so Vishwamitra is saying, because this is not a diseased condition, this is actually a function of great intelligence. As soon as we reason with him, then it will pass. Then we will dispel his delusion. What is the delusion? That I don't want to do my duties because everything in this world is meaningless. So he continues. After his mental dullness is removed by my reasoning, he will be able to rest in that happy state of mind to which we have arrived. He shall not only attain pure truth and a clear understanding of uninterrupted tranquility, but he will also secure a plumpness and beauty of figure and complexion as one derives from a potion of ambrosia. He will then fully discharge the proper course of his duties with all his heart and without exception, which will redound to his honor. He will become strong with a knowledge of both worlds, exempt from the states of pleasure and pain. Then he will look upon gold and stones with an indifferent eye. So this is the result that Vishwamitra is promising. That let me talk to the boy. <laughs> let me talk some sense into him. No, no, actually, he's saying... Let me talk reason to him. Let me reason with him and show him a superior way of dealing with this symptom. And what is the symptom? As we discussed last time, Rama has seen the world. He's gone out of the little uh, echo chamber of the palace and seen what life is really like. And he's going... This is bullshit. I don't like this. I don't want to get involved with it. I don't want to support it. I don't want to further it. And I don't want to play my part in a play that was designed by others. I want to simply be myself and be indifferent and detached. But his interpretation of indifference or dispassion is that one simply sits and does nothing. It's exactly the same kind of disease, mental disease, that demonstrated by Arjuna in the beginning of Bhagavad Gita. It's like, oh, this battle is messed up. This is really bad. I'm just not going to fight. I'm going to go to the forest and do nothing. And so Krishna's whole dialogue with Arjuna was to convince them that, hey, it doesn't matter. They're all dead anyway. So you might as well fight. And this is going to be the same line of argument, although presented in a different way, according to the time and circumstances that is used in Yoga Vasishta. Well, think about it. This whole society is simply as my Adi Guru Prabhupada used to say, a society of the cheaters and the cheated, the bullies and the bullied, huh? the dominators and the dominated. Terence McKenna used to call it dominator culture, and I think that's a perfect name. So this dominator culture is simply who can be the biggest bully on the block and pummel the opposite side into submission. Huh? Whose company can convince more idiots to buy their gizmos and software and other useless stuff huh? and collect the most money from sleeping people, they become the number one, uh, the A team. But what are they doing? In the process, they're destroying the environment. They're putting everybody in these cubicles 
They're making them into basically slave labor. Huh? You have to go to work so you can afford your house and your car so that you can rest and eat so that you can go to work. <laughs> it's crazy. And anybody who partakes of it gets involved in the craziness, contributes to the craziness. And then they wonder why they feel crazy themselves. Well, of course, the whole system is nuts. It's just a bunch of overgrown bullies. So <laughs> this competition in the world is based on words. If you're in team A, then you act in the interest of the team, uh, regardless of whether it's in your interest or not. And if the team wins, then you win. That's the theory anyway. But what really happens is that people wind up wasting their whole lives chasing money and power and position. Huh? Simply words, empty symbols, meaning nothing. When you come to the end of your life, if you have the great privilege and blessing of knowing when you're about to die, does the company so-and-so's last quarter results have any meaning for you? Huh? Does its profit to earnings ratio uh, have any significance? No. Does who won the last election or who's going to win the next election have any meaning for you if you're going to die tomorrow? Not a bit. And let's face it, any of us could die any minute. So really, we should look at things in that perspective, that anything can happen. I can die any minute and I'm going to die definitely uh, at some point. So in the light of that, does any of this have any meaning? See, this is Rama's thought, and we'll get deeply into this analysis <laughs> of the illusion of human society in the subsequent episodes. So now Rama has been brought, summoned from his inner apartment where he's been in seclusion. Huh? And what does Vishwamitra say to him? Why are your eyes so unsteady with doubts like trembling clusters of blue lotuses? You ought to do away with this unsteadiness and tell us about the sadness in your mind. What are these thoughts? What are their names and natures, their number and causes that infest your mind like mice undermine a fabric? I am disposed to think that you are not the person to be troubled with those evils and distempers to which the base and vile alone are subject. Tell me the craving of your heart, O sinless Rama. They will be requited in a manner that will prevent them from reoccurring to you. So this is Vishwamitra's consolation to Rama. He's saying, your mind is unsteady because of doubt. Yes, and it always should be like that. Huh? Our minds should always be filled with doubts of the illusory nature of reality which surrounds us. It's simply a projection. Uh, right down to the atoms and molecules and all the way up to the galaxies and clusters of galaxies and whatnot is all simply a projection on a screen of consciousness. And when consciousness changes, as it does when we go to sleep at night and when we go into dreams or when we go into deep sleep, shushupta, the whole reality disappears. This happens to everybody every day, and yet people don't question it. People don't doubt it. This is very hard for me to understand. Everybody experiences every day the whole world created, existing, and then disappearing. And yet they never question the reality of it. They never sit down with themselves and doubt. Huh? Is this really real? 
Is this really happening? Of course, we wake up in the morning from the dreams of sleep. But the dreams of waking are much more persistent and we don't wake up from those until the time of death. That's why death is such a powerful catalyst to inquiry into the real nature of things. So there's no, really no need to analyze the whole material universe to come to these conclusions. It's enough to observe one's own consciousness and mind and begin to inquire who or what am I? So Vishwamitra is offering Rama counseling. He's saying, tell us what's in your mind. What's going on? What are these thoughts that torment you? What are these doubts? Tell us all about it. We're all ears. Huh? We're willing to listen to everything you have to say. Why is that? Because the only way to overcome the doubts and the uncertainties of life is in a dialogue with an enlightened being. This is the real conclusion of this chapter. It's not enough to go off by yourself and doubt everything and meditate over it. Huh? Even skepticism, we should be even be skeptical towards skepticism because it can be overdone. So at some point we have to approach someone who has the answer, huh? who says that uh, you can attain the same happy state of mind to which we have arrived. And by we, he's referring to himself and the other sages, the other enlightened beings that are sitting there, that we have this happy state of mind. We're not troubled by these things anymore. You need to come to this same state. So you have to tell me what's on your mind so that I can counteract these specific doubts. There is no one generic teaching that will make everybody enlightened. Even though fanatical people are always searching for the one true path, huh? there ain't no such thing. Because each person's mind is unique. Each individual has a specific set of misconceptions about the world. Yeah, yeah, a lot of them are common to all, huh? such as the solidity of physical objects and so on, which modern science will tell you right off the bat isn't real. But everyone deep down has some certain specific doubts which need to be counteracted in a particular way that is only for that individual. In other words, they need a customized path to enlightenment. And that's what we've been telling here all along with the esoteric teaching, that there are a range of yogic practices. There's a range of philosophical teachings. It's not just one size fits all. But according to your particular individual needs, you need to approach someone who's realized and get their advice. There needs to be a dialogue, an extended dialogue, over years maybe, that will ultimately result in your cognizing the actual reality. So you don't get enlightened from meditation. Meditation can purify the mind and prepare you to receive the enlightenment. But ultimately, it's due to a certain cognition, a certain point of view, a certain, uh, I don't want to say transformation, <laughs> I want to say a certain quality of consciousness, which when it happens to you, then there's no going back to the old way of looking at things ever again because you have achieved liberation. Aung Tat Sat. Aung Harihi Aung.
கருணார்ணவமாய் கருதக்க தினல்கும் அருணாச்சல சிவம் கீதா